Alrighty. Welcome everyone. Hello. Hello. Okay. So this is going to be either very cool or a total train wreck. Either way, you'll enjoy it. My name is John, and I'm from a little company called Secret Lab. And um, so we make games, and I'm going to make one for you now. We're going to make a game. We're going to make a multiplayer game. We're going to make a multiplayer game in less than an hour. Now, this is a very silly thing to agree to do. So uh, don't do that in the future if you mean. We're going to be using Unity. Who here has ever used Unity before? Raise your hand. Okay, a few of you. Cool. That's cool. So I'm going to try my very best to make this not into a Unity talk that's like a promo for the brand. I'm very fond of Unity, and I, I'm, I'm friends with people who, who work at Unity. I'm going to try and make this not into a, uh, you should use Unity, because Unity is great. So, um, yeah. Now, the game we're going to be making is inspired by uh, one of my favorite games, and that is Unreal Tournament, the, the original one, because it came with this fantastic mode called InstaJib. Now, it's a really blown out picture there, but what you can see, there, there's like, people running around, there's shooting, there's death, explosions, all the, you know, the wholesome things that we associate with video games today. Um, so the thing about this particular mode was there's only ever one weapon, there's unlimited ammunition, and it's one shot, and, you, and you're dead. So that made that turn the whole game to a very frantic type of thing. So it's very fun. Um, we're not going to make anything that looks like this. We're going to make this. So um, it's uh, quite a bit simpler because uh, we don't have that much time. All right. So we're not going to be making this entirely from scratch. So we aren't going to be coding everything. I'm not going to be typing in because, one, that's boring as hell to look at, and, two, there's risks of typos breaking everything, and I have to go, oh, no, hang on, one sec, one sec, and then I go quiet for a bit. So I'll try and avoid that if I can. Um, and also, I'm going to be using prototyping assets that are available for free from the, uh, from the Unity Asset Store. So you can download the, those for free um, from Unity's thing. So very easy. OK, so let's actually get started. I have. Before I began here, I created a new project in Unity. This, so the only thing that I have done that, I, that you aren't seeing is I made a new project and I said, make this be a 3D project, not a 2D project. So let's talk about what is needed to make a multiplayer game. In a multiplayer game, one computer is the server and all other co uh, computers are the clients. So Typically, one of those computers is the server and the client at the same time, because one player wants to play the game and let others join them. That's different from what we call a dedicated server, where one, player, sorry, one computer is the server and no game actually happens on that computer. Everyone who's a human being is connected via their own computers that are clients. So testing a multiplayer game where you're both the server and the client is really fiddly because uh, you have to start the, uh, the program and then run it again at the same time. And, and, and on OS X, that can be a little bit of an issue because apps only run one at a time. So we're going to do a bit of a tricky thing to uh, allow us to run multiple copies of an app. OK, so to get started, I'm going to import that uh, set of assets that I grabbed here. So I'll just install that. Cool, all is good. Import. Nice. OK. So this isn't all of the Unity standard assets. It, the, the whole package is like a gigabyte in size and we'll be here waiting for about 10 minutes for it to, uh, to unpack. So uh, hooray, we've just saved a bit of time. I'm also going to do a little bit of setup before we get started properly, just to, again, save a bit of time. I'm going to disable a couple of things that uh, Unity will like to pop up. So in particular, I'm going to tell Unity that we don't care about the, um, the, the resolution screen. So the one that says, what resolution would you like to play the game in? No, I don't care about that. I'm also going to run it in a window, and I'm going to tell it to run in 640, 640 by 480. Now, the reason why I'm making it so small is so I can run this at, on the same screen as another copy of the game. And I'm also going to tell it to run in background. That's important for making a multiplayer game, because if the game pauses while you're uh, in the background, and that's the server, that can be a problem. OK, next step is I'm just going to say one more little bit of time and turn off a couple of advanced features. These two things here are doing some, uh, some advanced lighting calculations that look really good but can add uh, uh, a few minutes to your build times. So now we're all good. Let's start by making our scene. Our scene will be the environment in which we're going to be running around and uh, shooting each other with, uh, with, uh, with laser guns. So in the standard assets folder that we have, there's a prototyping section, and I've got two 
uh, prefabs, two pre-baked objects that are ready to use. One is the floor, which is going to be important. So I'll drag the floor out. There we go. There's our floor. I'm just going to resize that so it's a little easy to see as well. There we go. And pop. Okay, cool. Okay, so we have our floor. And I'm also going to add a couple of obstacles for us to run around and uh, use to take cover. So I'll drag a few of the, oops, of the pillar in. So one, and drag another one there. I'm just going to drag a, a few of these. And finally, I'm going to group all of these into a single object to make things a little easier for us because by, Unity has this feature where you can mark things as never going to ever move, and that'll help it uh, with performance. So I'll go game object, create empty, and I'm going to make an empty object called scene. I'll stick everything except the camera into that scene. So done. And then I'll say to Unity, this is a static object. Unity will say, do you want this for, the, for all of the objects? I'll say, yes. So what that does is we're promising that these will never move. So that's going to save us a, a, a bit of performance. Next up, in a multiplayer game, people are going to be joining the game at some point after the game starts. We need to tell Unity where the, those players should start from. So we'll create game starting points. Make another empty, jar, uh, uh, empty object. I'll rename that and call it player start one. And I'll add a component to it called network start position. There's no configuration here. All this is saying, this is an object from which a player can appear. All right. And I'll make one more of those as well. So name it player start two. I'll just move there, keep them tiny. And finally, so that I can see them, because these are invisible objects, I'm going to mark these as having a bit of a, oops, I need to do them one at a time. That one has a blue pill there, so I can see its name. You can see its name appearing um, in, uh, in the scene there. Done. All right, and I'll just move that over there. There, there we go, cool. So there's our two player start positions. Next up, our camera is currently looking in this direction here. It's looking straight ahead. You can see it like there. In a top-down game, we want the camera to often be looking down. So we'll, we'll, we'll adjust that. I'm going to rotate this by setting its rotation to about 65 degrees. You can see how the camera rotated there in the corner there. I'm also going to create a new empty game object called the camera rig and put the camera inside of it. Now, the reason why I do this is when I move the camera rig around the XZ plane, I'm moving the camera um, around here, and I don't have to care about the angle at which the camera is pointing. So that saves me uh, having to think about that. I'm just going to adjust its position here to be zero. OK. We're almost done with our setup, and we're just about ready to start adding in our networking stuff, the thing that we actually care about. Because everything so far is boilerplate, standard, um, scenes up, and uh, you'll find this in pretty much every single YouTube video about, uh, about how to make game immunity. So let's make our networking system. We'll begin by creating a game object that we'll, that we'll call the network manager. And the network manager is responsible for both A, running a server, and B, being a client and connecting to a server. So I've made a game object. I'm going to rename that network manager. Cool. And we'll call, we'll add a new component called network manager. So this has a bunch of advanced features. I'm not going to talk about them. But what I want to focus on here is that inside the spawn info tab, we're going to be adding an object here saying this object here in player prefab is going to be the thing that represents players. Great. Next thing, we'll go network manager HUD. This means that it will show a little, um, a little bit of a box that uh, will, will uh, save us having to implement our own connect to server dialog. So we'll run the application. And it says, great, so we've got the camera looking down, we've got uh, buttons here, we can connect to a host, we can, uh, we, we can be a server, we can connect to a client. Um, so all is good. So we can click that. And uh, well, you can't see anything very cool there, but we just ran our first server. So congratulations us. OK. Yay! <laughs> OK. So video games tend to have players. Players in this game will be represented by a gray capsule. You saw that screenshot of it earlier. So let's make that. We're going to create an object. Uh, first of all, we'll start empty. It's always good to start with an empty object because you can always add more things to it later. I'll rename it and call it player. And I'm going to create a capsule, so a gray capsule, and that will be the visual representation of our player. 
So game objects, 3D objects, capsule. And I'm going to rename that, call it player graphics, and place it as a child of the player. Done. All right, so here's our player. I'm just going to zoom in a bit. So here's, there we are. So we have no way, because a capsule is round the entire way, um, there's no way to tell which direction it's facing. So I'm going to add a little bit of a, like a, a looks like a gun. Well, it looks nothing like a gun, but it'll be analogous to a gun. We'll go game objects, create a new cube, and I'm going to make this cube be uh, about six wide, and then I'll scale the whole thing down. Here, done. There. So there's, there's that little player's gun. All right, and I'm also going to change the color of this by changing its material to one of the predefined ones that I just imported called yellow. So now we can see, and it's easier to, easier to visualize. All right, and also make sure that cube is inside the player object so that it moves when the player moves. When we create a multiplayer game, each new client will receive a copy of this player object. So they'll have complete control over this object and nothing else. This is called an authoritative uh, client-server model. The idea of this is only the computer that is running as a server has full control over the world. All of the clients have very limited control of the world. All they can say is, I'm here, and I click the fire button. So if you are uh, designing a game to avoid cheating, this is very important, because you're not, you're, if you're making a game in which clients can say, I killed that guy, then all you have to do is write a special version of the, of the game that every tick says, for all clients, I killed them, and suddenly you've ruined the game. So we're avoiding cheating by making sure that only the server, only one computer, has full control of everything. All right. One last thing to do before we're ready with this client, uh, with this player uh, object here, is we'll add a new component called network identity. Now, what this is is this is a label for the object saying this is this particular object on the network. Network identity allows you to maintain state for for individual objects across multiple computers. It keeps them in sync. And we'll also turn on local player authority. This is a uh, a flag that says this object is controlled by the local player, not by the server. So this is the only thing that, that, that uh, clients have full control over. Okay, we're done with this object here. I'll drag it into Unity's uh, folder and make a new prefab, which means that we'll be able to make copies of it later on. And I'll remove from the scene, go to our network manager, and say that the player prefab is player. Whoops, player. Done. Okay. Now, whoops. Now, we'll launch the game and hit host, and there's our player. And it appeared at the point where we said there's a player start. So to verify this is actually a multiplayer game, I'm going to save this scene. So call it main. I'm going to build a copy of the game. So make sure it's built for universal. Uh, add the current scene. Build. And I'm going to put this in a fold uh, in, in here called uh, Dev World. So this is going to then generate a Mac version of this project, so it won't have to run inside Unity. It'll be a thing that I can zip up and give to my friends, or my customers. Um, so give that a second to compile everything down. In the meantime, you can stand here and watch me look awkward. Okay. So, oh, that's okay, it's done. But I had to make up some words, but no, we're good. Okay, so we'll launch the application. You can turn that off. Um, <laughs> so here we are. Now, we're in the game. We'll hit host. There's our player. Cool. Now we'll start the game inside Unity. Game starts up, and I'll say, join a client. Great, and now you can't see it very well, but you can see the shadow of the other client over there. <laughs> And there we go. Now we've verified that we're able to connect to our server. So that's a, that's a very important first step. Right. So I can't do anything now. I can't move them around. There's no way for me to do anything besides join the game and go, hooray. So what we want to have happen now is we want to um, allow players to move their players around, move their little capsules around. But very importantly, when I say move the player, everyone else in the game also sees that my player moved. Now this is a thing that can, uh, can really trip people up because it's not guaranteed that when you move or change the state of some object on your client, 
that others are going to receive the information. It has to go to the server. The server then has to verify that that's a good move to make, good, good data to, to use to change the state, and then that gets sent back down to all the other clients. So to make that happen, what we do is we're going to add a new component to this called a network transform. Now, one of the problems with network-based programming and really game engines of any type is they tend to get really focused on their own approaches and their own implementations of how they have solved certain problems. So you'll see terms like network identity and network transform, and these words aren't really applicable to out stuff outside Unity. But the problems that they solve are the same regardless of what they call. So when, when I say the words network transform, what you should hear is the thing that synchronizes state between objects. And that's a problem that is solved by every single engine. So ignore the fact that it's, it's called something weird. OK, so a network transform needs to know what it should be synchronizing. We're going to be using a feature of Unity called the character controller. And the character controller is uh, basically, it's a really simple script that it says, OK, it, uh, a character takes up this much volume in space, and it knows how to walk around, and, and gravity affects it, and some, some simple stuff like that. So we'll tell the network transform that we are synchronizing the character controller. So whenever this moves, um, then all other players should receive that. Additionally, we want our camera to follow the player around. So we want to be able to run every frame a command saying, try and move the camera so we keep the player in focus. One problem, there's more than one player, which means that we have to be able to say, all right, when you are running on this machine, and uh, you know what your player is, therefore you should keep track of this particular character. So we're going to implement a little script on the camera before we do anything with the player, just to avoid a bit of uh, confusion. So the camera rig, we're going to add a new script. And this is the first bit of coding we're going to start doing. Notice we've written no code so far. Um, we're going to create a new component called lerp follow target. Lerp means linear interpolation. Basically, it's a technique we can use to soften and smooth out the animation. I'll make a new script, write it in C sharp. Great. So if I've done this right, there it is, lerp follow target. OK. So I'll start just by deleting the boilerplate and drag in our first bit of code. OK. So the lerp follow target is saying, OK, I have a, let me zoom in a bit. I have a thing that I'm following. I have a distance that I'm above that target. To, so I don't like try and zoom into where the thing is. I'm trying to zoom to where it is above. And also a speed. OK. Next in, I'll add the actual code. Oops, indented it. Doesn't really matter what this does, this is not very specific to multiplayer games. But what this is doing is saying, we want to, every frame, try and move a little bit closer, not the full distance, but a little bit closer to where our target now is. Now, the reason why we do it a little bit closer rather than jumping exactly to that point is if the player moves around, the camera should slowly catch up rather than it being locked and feeling rigid. It doesn't feel quite as nice. So having, having a kind of like linear interpolation like this will uh, make the game feel better. OK, so we jump back into Unity. It will compile. And there we go. Here's all our stuff. I'm going to increase the speed to 4. Just from past experience. OK. Now, I'm going to add uh, some code to our player that allows it to receive input from the, uh, from the keyboard that makes it move around. So I'll go to our player prefab. I'll add a, a new script in the exact same way as before. So I'll create a new thing called player, new script, write it in C sharp. Great. OK. I, uh, First bit, we need to know how fast our player is moving. So we'll say a, a speed of 10 units per second, 10 meters per second, which is really quite fast, but oh, it's a video game, doesn't matter. Next, we're going to have a method called onStartLocalPlayer. OnStartLocalPlayer is called when this object starts up and, importantly, the object that it's attached to is the user's player, this, this human being's own player. And what, the, what it does, it says, OK, get the lerp follow target that is attached to the camera and say, follow this, follow this player. So we're saying, hey, camera, follow me. Don't follow anybody else. Next up, we're going to implement a method called apply movement. All this is doing is it's saying, hey, input system, 
you should know information about well, what the player is pressing, what well, the pressing W to, to go forward and D, D to go right and things like that. So use that to update the position in the game. Additionally, we'll work out where the mouse is and use it to rotate the, the, the player to aim to follow the camera, uh, to follow the cursor. Okay, and one last bit. Every frame, we say, call that apply movement function that we just added, and only if we have authority over our player. So this update function is running on all computers for all players. So if there's um, two players in the game and two computers, it's running four times across the entire world. This should only run if we are on the computer that owns this player. So this means we aren't going to end up moving the other player by mistake. We only want to, only want to move ourselves. Okay. Now that we've added that, I'm also going to add a bit of a workaround. There was a bug in Unity that uh, caused it to... Um, you, could, you would only rotate if you moved as well, and so what this does is it looks for any changes to rotation, and if it does, it changes your position by 0 .0001 to, in, to ensure that it gets updated across the network. Okay, and finally, we need to change this little bit here and say this is a network behavior rather than the basic behavior, so using unityengine.networking. Okay. So that will compile, and I should have no more errors. I don't. Brilliant. Now, when I run the game, I'll host the game, and I can press the W, A, S, and D keys, and I can walk around. So that's all looking good. The camera's a bit off, but we'll fix it in a bit. Okay. Now, moment of truth, we will build and run the game again, and we'll run our two concurrent copies, and if all goes well, we'll have them walking around next to each other. Okay. So let's play the game. Resize that, make that fill the whole screen so I can see what's going on. And I'll host in here, and I'll connect in here, and hooray, cool. Moving around, nice. Yay, thank you. Okay, and you'll notice there is a bit of lag here. Lag is the thing that, and by the way, the majority of this lag comes from the fact that my computer is doing a bunch of different things. It's uh, recording this video, and it's doing Unity, and it's doing the game. So in a real-world situation, you wouldn't have this much lag. But this is a good time to talk about lag and why it is the thing that you'll hate the most if you're making multiplayer games. If you have played a multiplayer game, you've always blamed lag for why you missed. And I'm here to reassure you, yes, that was probably the reason. The reason is, is especially in fast-paced games like first-person shooters or any other kind of shooters, the time taken from you hitting the fire button to the server receiving the information through to all other players being told about that shot can be on the order of about 100 milliseconds. And if someone's moving really fast, especially if they're moving uh, perpendicular to your, um, your aiming direction, then you're almost guaranteed to miss. You have to lead the target and all kinds of different things that you learn to develop as a player. Now, it becomes even worse if you have variable lag. If, you're, if the latency between you and the server is varying from 50 milliseconds up to 100 over time, and you have no uh, way for the, uh, for the game to, to say, OK, well, then I'll just shift everything by 50 milliseconds consistently, then eventually you end up in this, in this weird situation where the game is uh, trying to shoot, and then you'll end up, depending on the engine, receiving a shot um, around a corner because the game tried to anticipate where the shot was going to go. So um, that typically only happens in games where there's much more sophisticated lag compensation. But um, yeah, variable lag is one of those things that you learn to uh, really, really despise. OK, let's get back to working on our video game. We are going to add support for weapons. So because it isn't really a game unless you can kill someone, um, as I've been told. So. What we're going to do is we're going to add support for a very simple weapon. We're going to add a thing called a hit scan weapon. Who here knows the term hit scan? Okay, so what hit scan means is it's a term that actually originally came from a oh, long, long ago back when uh, internet connections were not very good. And so when you shoot someone with a real world weapon, typically you are emitting a projectile and it takes time from the, from the point of, of, of your muzzle out over to the target. It can take a few milliseconds for it to arrive. It can take a few nanoseconds if you're shooting a particle beam. Um, in a real 
video game, though, it's not really worth the additional effort required to simulate the movement of an object over time when really you could just say, what's over there at this instant? Is it, is it bad guy? Okay, he's dead. Like, that's what a hit scan is. You cast a ray out into the game's physics simulation and you query what was hit. And if what was hit uh, happened to be a thing that can receive damage, then you say, okay, you're dead, rather than having to mimic the whole simulation. Most popular games these days do not do hit scan weapons. They actually do the simulation of projectiles over time. If you ever played Call of Duty, that is not actually doing hit scan. It's doing full simulation, um, mostly because people have really good internet connections these days. But for our game, it's a lot easier for us to hit scan because it requires a lot less code. So we're going to shoot lines out into the world when a player presses their fire button. That's going to be the mouse button for me. We want to visualize what this looks like because otherwise it isn't really fair for someone to just suddenly die and not know where the shot came from. So we're going to, show, we're going to draw lines that indicate um, the shot. So we're going to create our, uh, a, uh, a shot object which we'll be using as a prefab and then this will appear every time a player shoots their weapon. We'll create a new game object, a new empty one. I'm going to name it shot. This is going to use a line renderer. A line renderer draws, as you might imagine, a line from one point in space to another. So I'm going to create a new component. It's called a line renderer. There it is. I'm going to create a material for this line renderer. You'll notice right now it's bright purple. That's because there's no material assigned to it. And so Unity goes, well, this is probably an error on your part. I'm going to draw it as something very lurid. So I'm going to create a new material. Create a material. So a material defines what an object looks like. So I'll also call it shot. A material uses a shader to define how that material looks on, uh, on screen. So the shader that we want is a very simple one. It's called particles additive. And particles additive uh, is an additive blend from one object to another. Basically, it's really good for this kind of thing. Okay, so we'll go for a, uh, a white color that is semi-transparent. Oh, that was alpha. There we go. Great. OK. And now we will go back to our shot object and say, use this material. So I'll drag that shot material that I just made. Boom. OK, now it's white. That's actually a bit too white. I'm just going to drop that down a bit. There we go. There, now you can see through it. Now, the reason why I'm making it semi-transparent is if you shoot multiple times, I want them to stack. So they, they get brighter if there's multiple shots overlapping each other. So it's, again, one of the little, little features that uh, can look quite nice. OK, a few bits of con configuration to do. I'm going to tell this that it should not cast or receive shadows, because this is like a, 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 a trace in air. So it would look a bit weird. I'll turn off receive shadows. I'll turn off light probes. Again, it's an another weird lighting thing. And also, I'm going to make this quite thin. So this shot should not be as thick as those pillars. It should be a very thin thing. And our bullets are very small, so we'll go 0 0.1, 0 0.1. So there's our, you can see, much smaller there. There's our, uh, our shot. And there we go. OK, cool. Next up, when a shot hits something, I want there to be some kind of impact effect. So I want sparks to fly when you shoot it, just like in the movies. Now, I've got one already made. Um, the reason why I'm going with, with one already made rather than making one on stage like I just did with that line is because particle effects are fiddly, and they're really fiddly. <laughs> So I've got one here. Where is it? Particle systems, prefabs, impact sparks. So I'll show, show you what it looks like. So there. So look at that. I don't know if you saw it. I'll zoom in a bit. So here's our. So when there's an impact, look at that. So when there is a impact on any object, we're going to do some math, work out where that point should be, work out which angle those sparks should be flying in, and then cause all clients to display that spark effect. So I'll get rid of that from the scenes moment. We're, we're done there. OK. Oh, one thing that's worth pointing out. Um, the particle system has a particle system destroyer script attached to it, which means that it's going to be removed from the scene between three and four seconds from now. If we didn't do that, then the game will just fill up with these expired sparks, and it'll look bad. We need, uh, we're now done setting up our line, but there's an important thing to do. When we shoot, we're going to be telling all clients, draw this line. Now, we do that by telling all clients to instantiate a shot object. To instantiate something over the network, you need to have a network identity on it. So when you do that, 
Notice we're leaving this off. It's created by the server, it's run by the server, but when you have this, it can be spawned. All right, next I'm going to add some code to this. This is going to be some code that receives information from the server saying, okay, here's where the shot starts from, here's where it goes to. So I'll add a new shot script. Okay, so here it is. Get rid of that ball plate. And also I'm going to make this be a network behavior and also use the networking package. All right, so shot. First of all, we have five different variables that are important. The start point, where the shot started. The end point, I'll leave you to guess what that means. The impact forward direction, which is the direction in which the spark should fly. A Boolean variable, whether or not we should show an impact at all. If we shot into empty space, we should not show a spark and we should not uh, cause that uh, hit on performance. And also the prefab to spawn, uh, which represents which object are the sparks. Okay, now that's done. I'll drag in the shot. Start, okay. So start is called when an object is created. And all this does is it sets up the line saying, okay, so start here and there. And also, um, if show impact is true, then call the show impact function, which I'll add in a second. Now, these variables, start point, end point, and show impact, these actually be set by the server. So this is going to be an object that runs on the client, but it'll receive its values from the server. And that, that's done automatically by Unity. Now I'll drag in one last thing, and that is the shot, sorry, the show impact uh, function. So all this is doing is saying, instantiate our sparks at the right position, facing the right direction. Great. One more thing. I'm going to add a, uh, to our shot here, a renderer fader. Did I write that? No, cool. Um, renderer fader. What this is, is the script that fades out Whoops, render, uh, I, I, miss, I misspelled it, but that's fine. Um, live coding. Um, and all this does, I'm not going to explain this in as much detail, but all it's doing is it's making it fade from whatever value it is right now to zero. So it's going to fade out over time. So just like real bullet trails do, because this is a really realistic game. Um, <clears throat> okay. So we've set up our shot. I'm going to... Uh, drag this shot prefab uh, object into here, make it a prefab, and now it can be created. So that's now gone. Now we're going to make it so that our player is able to create these shots. I'll go to the player object, I'll make a new script. Player weapon. What player weapon does is it is responsible for listening for the mouse click that is a command to create a new shot. When, it, uh, when that happens, we have to tell the server from the client, hey server, I want to shoot my gun. So, drop that in there. A few variables that we have to have. First is the shot trace prefab that we want to spawn. Second is where we're going to be shooting the gun from. It's not going to be the center of the play, it'll be that, at the end of that cube we added earlier. And also how accurate it should be. Okay. Next, every frame, if we own this object, and if the fire one button was clicked, that's the left mouse button, we call a function called command shoot. Now I'm going to add that in here and explain why it's got that weird command at the front. A command is a message sent from a client to the server saying, hey server, please do this. So when I said command shoot, the, the, the client is actually translating that into a call to a special behind the scenes thing saying, okay, send a message of type command shoot to whichever computer is called the server. And then on the server, this function then gets run. So in the client, we're going, please shoot. And on the server, we're saying, okay, we've received a request to shoot from a player. Let's do that. So this is now calculating the direction in which the shot is fired based on how, how accurate we want to be. We then cast a ray out into the world. We want to work out where that line ended. And we want to pick a point that is far away by default, because if we didn't hit anything, we still want to show that line. So we have to have an endpoint for that line. We'll get the direction that was hit, will default to zero. Should we show impact sparks, default to false, unless we hit something? Actually perform the raycast, and then if we did hit something, then update where those sparks should come from. Then we instantiate and set up our shot. Now, that, this is everything that we just set up a, a moment ago. But importantly, we then have to call a function called network server spawn. Network server spawn tells all connected clients that we have just made a new object, the server has just made a new object, 
and all clients should, should credit as well. So this is how we ensure that all clients see that line. Done. Okay, now, whoops, oh, I made a mistake. I forgot to set this up here, so this is network behavior again. Great, cool. And let me compile, great, it's done. Now, we will select our player, we will set the shot trace prefab to that, that's the thing that appears when we shoot. The shoot point will be the end of the gun, so that will be the, end, uh, the, the cube there. All right, now we'll test it. Okay, so that was a lot of coding and not much demoing, but uh, it's all quite necessary. There we go. So now, when I shoot, it pops out. Now, oh, I've got, ah, I meant, I, I haven't quite fixed the things up here. Impact effect prefab was not set. That's very easy to fix. We go impact spark done. So I forgot to link up the uh, sparks to the shot, so I didn't know what to what, what to create. Okay. Now, oh, still not doing it. Oh, I know why. <laughs> the shots are going over the pillars. Okay. That's easy to fix. I'll move the cube down. <laughs> yeah, okay. So move that down. There, update that, apply, delete that from the scene now that we've made our changes. And there we go. Okay. It's not working all the time because mostly because it's I should have moved it down a little, a little bit even further. But it's bouncing off and looking looking kind of nice. One last thing though, if we have two players and they shoot each other, nothing actually happens. We get the impact effects, but nothing happens because we haven't written anything that make, would make something happen. We have to implement damage taking. So we want to have something that says, if you are hit by a weapon, then destroy that object, remove from the game. So we'll add one more script and we'll add it to our player and we'll call it damage taking. So damage taking, is, whoa, I haven't got right here, okay, damage taking, there we go. Damage taking is very straightforward. It has a function called take damage. It's marked as a server side function, so clients aren't allowed to say, hey, you take damage, you have to say to the server, hey, I shot my gun, maybe that will cause something to take damage later on. Um, and take damage says, if you take damage, then remove from the game, network server destroy, remove from the game. Okay, but one problem. If I destroy another player and I destroy their player object, what does that mean? They're gone forever. So what we want to have happen instead is if a player object is destroyed, create a new one and make them have that instead. So we'll create a script called player respawning. And here, let it compile. Player respawning. Oops, I forgot to mark this here as a network behavior again. Otherwise, we would have a bit of a problem. Okay. okay. And player respawning. Okay, and what player respawning does is it listens for, well, first of all, it, oh, this one first here, actually. So, on network destroy, is we have just been destroyed. If we are the server and we are allowed to respawn, I'll add that in a second, then we'll create a new player at the right point, tell the network system to spawn it, and then say, hey, I'm now this object. My, this player is now this newly created object. There is one bit of a problem, though. If you stop the game, that counts as destroying it, which means that you can actually spawn a new thing as you quit the game, and that can cause problems inside Unity. So as a bit of a workaround, we will add a thing here saying, had a flag called allow respawning, and if the application quits, then disable it, and that will uh, fix that. Okay. Now this is done. Okay, let that compile. Do we have any errors? No, we don't. Brilliant. Okay. So we'll now do our 
third multiplayer test, we'll build the whole thing, we'll then run two concurrent versions of the game and we'll try and shoot each other. So we'll start, that's starting in the background, start the game here, resize that, move that there, okay, we'll host inside Unity, we'll connect from this other one here, and now I'm going to move them over here and I'm going to go, pow, nothing happens. Um, <laughs> Okay. What happened here? Okay, cool. Now we get to that awkward bit of uh, me shuffling around going, okay, what's, what did I, what did I break? Okay, damage taking is done. Weapon spawning is done. Oh, I know what I did not uh, did wrong. Okay, cool. The reason why we are not doing anything is because we didn't update our weapon script. So our weapon script here, where is the player weapon? Okay, when we, call, uh, when we cast out in, into the scene, what we want to do here is we say, if we hit something that has damage taking, then it, um, we should call that damage taking function. So, there. Okay, that actually was not planned, um, despite how smooth that looks. So, um, so, we say, for each damage taking component that we found, call take damage on it. Okay, let's try that one more time. Okay, we'll jump back into here, we'll let Unity compile, oops, damage shaking, what have I done wrong, damage shaking, up, uh, useful nothing, okay, and done. Okay, we'll build the game, we'll run it, we'll play it, and then hopefully we will have succeeded. How are we doing for time, by the way? Wait, what? Oh, cool, nice. We have eight minutes. Yes! Cool, cool. So, ah, that's fine. All right. Okay, run the game, run the game, we have to play the game. So we'll resize that so we can see two things at the same time. So this is hosting, now this is the client. Cool, and now when I shoot this guy here, okay, didn't work. Oh, it doesn't matter. Okay, so clearly what's going wrong here is I'm not spawning the right time. Oh, I know what I haven't done right. I haven't actually been uh, telling the other client to uh, register that as a prefab that can be instantiated, but that's okay because we're out of time anyway. You get the idea. So, <laughs> thank you. So, takeaways. Multiplayer can be a lot of fun. It can add a lot of fun to your games, and it's really fun to just play around with. But... If you want to start making video games, don't start with a multiplayer game. There's so much else that can go wrong. Um, so the various tools that I used today, um, actually there's only one, and that was uh, Unity. You can get that for free at unity3d.com. Again, I'm not trying to pitch you on trying to buy that. Um, I just love it a lot, and uh, it's really, really uh, cool. There's a lot of cool things happening inside that community. Um, you can find me at tothesecretlab.com. Um, Secret Lab's uh, Twitter is right there on screen, the secret, uh, at the Secret Lab. Thank you very much. Yeah.